He is wiped out by His grace through faith in Christ. Your every sin, every sin, past, present, future. Christian hedonist is somebody who says that my greatest joy, my greatest good is God. And therefore, I will pursue that joy and I will pursue that God above all else. So God's glorified and I'm satisfied. You are now listening to the Pastor Discussions Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number 21 of the Pastor Discussions Podcast. I'm John. And I'm Joe. And this is your weekly conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. And it's officially summer. It's, 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 it's gotten hot. Like, yeah, it's super it's like fast. 90 degrees or something like that yesterday <laughs> at like really, 5 p.m. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding me? Were you? Did you guys have baseball yesterday? No. Well, uh, yeah. I like. I had to skip out on that. I, I haven't been to the gym at all this week. And I was like, I have got to get to the gym. So I went to the gym and worked out and I walked outside after I worked out and I was like, Oh my goodness, what is going on here? <laughs> this is it almost, it was horrible. So, uh, yeah, that, I think summer is going to be really wicked hot. Uh, it comes and goes. Yeah. So it, we'll probably have a 50 degree day here in a few days. Yeah, probably. So it'll, then it'll snow. Yeah. <laughs> this is Nebraska. I think That's we might be does. past that. So. Hopefully. I, we've got a bunch of plants out in the backyard that. You don't care about that. I don't. Carly does. Yeah. And therefore I do by extension. <laughs> <laughs> but now like everybody's done with school now. Like today's like, yeah. like Facebook's been blowing up with like first day, last day pictures of, of, uh, kids and like last days of school for kids. And our girls had their clothes. Our girls go to a Lutheran school here in town. I saw it. Michaela sent, sent Oh that. my gosh. <laughs> so they sang a little, uh, send out hymn. And one of the lines in it, um, was basically talking about how we're God's children through baptism. Yeah. And we're going to have to explore that in a podcast yeah, episode. And we've actually been having to work through that with our oldest daughter uh-huh. because she's started to confuse some of those things, um, of, baptism is required for salvation yeah um so like some of those things that we hadn't seen in the first Mm -hmm. because our oldest is she just finished second grade so we've been in the school three years and some of those things are starting to yeah that that lutheran stuff of um which it's a good lutheran church um it's not a it's not a liberal it's not a liberal crazy one but still some of those but they're still luther like luther was so confused on baptism i know like luther luther's view on baptism was like I, look, I the Roman Catholic Church is wrong on justification, but I still kind of can't get far enough away from their view on baptism. Yeah. And the Lord's Supper. Like, it, it was like those two things were just like baptism and the Lord's Supper were just very confusing in the Reformation time. We'll have to do a show on it. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, so anyway, but the, the ceremony for, and this is for uh, kindergarten through eighth grade, it lasted an hour and 20 minutes. Holy mess. Oh my gosh. Really? I, I had, I had Ian. So we just went out into the hallway because <laughs> he had lots of energies. So he just ran around, but yeah. How do you do? What did they, what took an hour? And so they did, they do opening ceremony and then they sing a song and the, like the kids get up in front and it, of course there's, you know, you got kindergarten through seventh grade. It's going to sing a song. So it takes them like five <laughs> minutes to get up on the stage yeah. in the worship center. And and then they sit back down and then they give out all these awards and there's just so many awards to get. Because everybody's got to get one. Not everybody, but they give out attendance awards and they give out, you know, uh, like academic awards mm-hmm. and, and all this other stuff. And then they sing another song and and then our, our principal was leaving. So they did a whole. Like a goodbye thing. Yeah, goodbye yeah. thing. So it was just. And then it was like 90 degrees in there too, because yeah. I don't think they have air conditioning in the <laughs> sanctuary. So, so yeah, it was a fun, fun night. The only graduation that I've ever attended was my seminary graduation. And that was enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> they had, like, in fact, today, the day that we're recording, Southern Seminary is graduating their, their students. And so I was, I was flipping through Facebook and they had the Facebook live and, and they were, I was watching it as all the students were walking in and they've got this organ that is <laughs> playing like this massive pipe organ that is playing. And I hate the sound of an, they it were, sounds like you're strangling cats <laughs> in a bag they and were, then drowning. They them. were playing an organ last night. At oh really? The Lutheran church. Oh, that's at such Lutheran a painful ceremony. sound. Like whoever thought that an organ was a good sound <laughs> needs to get their hearing checked because to me, it's, I would rather listen to people scratching on chalkboards <laughs> with their fingernails and listen to an organ. So we did the, like the, the seminary graduation, 
and I didn't go to my college graduation. Uh, I was homeschooled. So it was like, Hey, congratulations. You graduated high five. Uh, but yeah, like I, I was like, uh, yeah, I, it's exhausting. I, it is exhausting. This is like, seriously, there's the, like, the formality around it and the pomp and circumstance and everything else. I, I don't know. I personally, I don't get it. Like, I, I don't get it either, but like, yeah. there's, they stuff all the people they could into that little yeah. worship center that they have over there. So, yeah. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's an idolization. It's an identity thing. Oh, which really it could be an identity in. thing. <laughs> what, is it? Ooh, what would that say about your identity? Speaking of identity as a smooth transition, uh, we're getting better at this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, today we're talking about identity in Christ. That's our topic for today. What let's, let's talk about just identity in general. Like, uh, what are we talking about when we talk about identity? Uh, so I, like it's what do you who do you see yourself as um what do you identify with like some here's some, what we're not talking about we're not talking about self identifying right like i self identify as an 80 year old woman <laughs> clearly not an 80 year old woman i didn't like, even think about that we're not talking about this this like modern definition <laughs> okay. of identity just to clarify on the front end because i this could be really confusing like what we're not talking we're not talking about like i get to be whoever i I want to be, I think we're talking more along the lines of like where you find your, your joy and value and yeah, when you think, sense of who you are. Right. When you think of yourself, who are you and, or what are you? What defines you? Yeah. So most, I would say for most men, like when I ask, like what do guys do when they get together and they meet? Oh, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. I mean, we identify with um, ourselves with what we do Yeah. for, for our job. Yeah. So we're talking more along those lines and, and same thing for, for ladies as well. It, sometimes, I mean, I'm sure the questions are different, but like, what do you find your identity in ultimately? Yeah. Um, are you, uh, I used to be an electrician. So are you an electrician? Is that where your identity is found? Mm -hmm. Um, are you a huge sports fan? Do you talk about sports all the time? Is that, is that part of your identity? Um, and there's, those are, those are probably the two that I, that I am biggest with. So those are the two that are in my mind, but, um, I don't know. I didn't, didn't think about defining that. It just seems like it's, it's like an obvious, yeah, it's kind thing, of right? obvious thing. So here's how I thought about defining it. Like, <clears throat> it, like I, it's sort of along the same lines as, as what you were saying. But if you walk up to somebody and you say, Hey, tell me about yourself. What would they say? Yeah. Um, what are the first things that what come are the out of their mouth? things that come out of their mouth? What are the first things that come to their mind? Um, you know, you might it might get answered like you were saying, like I'm an electrician or I, I, what do we do? That's where guys tend to go to. Yeah. What are our hobbies? What are the things that we love? Uh, what are the things we talk about a lot? Cause yeah. I mean, that's the time back to what you say, but conversations normally go one, two, they go through a progression and you'll talk about, you'll, you'll find out what the person is into mm -hmm. and where, their maybe their affections are at in yeah. at the things in life pretty quickly, and those those things are where they find their value and worth. Right, that's sort of the big the big idea there is like identity is where where do you find your value and worth? What defines who you are? And 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 so uh, <clears throat> as as we're talking about this identity thing, so here's here's the thing: identity is a huge issue. Um, identity is an issue, and it can be skewed into like self esteem or self-worth or self-value, like those types of things, like sort of the, some of this language, but, but like really, if we, if we're talking about self-worth and dignity and stuff like that, we should be talking uh, identity in creation. So we're created as image bearers of God. And that is where our value and worth and dignity come from. When we're talking about what that, what, what has come out of that and, and what sin has done and what the gospel does, that's where we're talking about identity, at least for us, right? So we're created in the image of God, we have worth and value and dignity because of that. And so, uh, so this self-esteem issue uh, is not an identity issue. It's a fall issue. So what happens is the the fall happens and man 
sins against God and something happens in Adam to all of us. In other words, we are born sinners. That's our identity as human beings right. after and, the fall. And that leads into all the yes. issues that we have of where we find our identities other than in Christ. Because if you don't have Christ, your identity, you got to find your identity in something. Exactly. And then even after conversion, that you still are coming off of where my identity was before I was with Christ and now that identity. And it, we have a hard time, I think, um, overcoming that at times yeah. as believers of still reverting back to my identity is found in this and in this and said, no, my identity is found in I am a converted child of God. Which is different from what our identity was before. So Correct. that's that's the, that's the important point I wanted to make. So if if you look at the fall and what the fall did, the fall messed up everything that God created as good. And the the outflow and the results of that are issues with like self-esteem or issues with trying to figure out who I am or what defines me. Because ultimately with the when the Bible talks about us apart from God, apart from Christ, after the fall, the Bible identifies us as sinners. That is our primary identity. We are rebels and sinners and fallen creatures that don't want God, that don't seek God, and that live our lives with functional gods that seek to replace God's rightful place. Right. And I think that we even struggle with that identity, though, because God gives us a conscience mm -hmm. uh, naturally. Yeah. So that's where you see the struggle and people find trying to find their identity and find uh, what the, what their purpose is in in all these things. And that's where you get all this craziness of well, I'm this and I'm this, or even this new age stuff of uh, identifying <laughs> ourselves as something we're not. Yeah. Like we're, we're just physically, it's physically impossible to be identified in the way some people are identifying themselves. Yeah. That's all that comes out of ultimately back to the fall and this confusion and this, but we still have like the, like God has created us as moral beings. Yeah. And we've got some of those natural characteristics as all of us, all humanity being image bearers of God. Yeah. And so this fight with um, sin nature that we're stuck in and that moralism, I think, t I think it's tied all tied into this identity problem. Isn't it funny how, uh, how most Christians would say uh, things like, okay, the, like you were talking about with like the, the self identifying as uh, with sexuality or self identifying with it. Like, no, no, you're clearly not. That's, that's, obvious and evident. And yet we all in some sense at some point in our lives have deluded ourselves into thinking that we're basically good. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's just an, like we, we've just in the same way that somebody will say the self identify with, um, with a sexual orientation or something like that. We all tend to self identify ourselves as good. Absolutely. And we, we fool ourselves into thinking that we actually are good and we try to justify it. when any objective look at ourselves and, and if not from the outside, from the inside will clearly reveal that we are not good as scripture points out. So scripture says things like no one is good. No, not even one. No one seeks God. And we tend to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on a second. I'm basically a good person. That's an identity issue, right? That's failure to recognize our identity as God has laid out in his word, apart from Jesus Christ is utterly corrupt and wrong. All that, all that judgment comes out of that, that identity issue too, yep. that moralistic uh, Christians can tend to look at other people and say, well, I'm not that bad. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that, I'm not that bad off. I, I'm better than they are. So that, that's an identity issue. That's a, the, uh, it's a pride. Yeah. Uh, there's a, that self-esteem. There's mm -hmm. that I've, I've pulled myself up and yeah. I've done these things instead of seeing yourself as in the same, you were in the same condition that that person that you're passing judgment on now. Exactly. It might manifest itself in different yeah. ways, but fundamentally our identity apart from Christ and after Adam is the same. Yep. We bear God's image. We have worth, value, and dignity because of that. Yet the image of God is marred and tainted and... And we're blind. Yeah, and, and, and by sin, and we're blind, and Just we like they are. are... We have inherited Adam's 
uh, guilt and his nature such that our identity is we are sinners apart from God, against God, and under his wrath and judgment. Now, that sounds really depressing. So, That's why we need the gospel. Right. So the, how does the gospel change our identity? Or how does the gospel deal with this identity issue? Because it puts our identity in Christ and not in ourselves. Unpack that. <laughs> Okay, so so you, I mean, we've talked about we've talked about how God created us to be in relationship with Him, like He did with Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. and then the fall, they that relationship was broken. We were falling apart. So Christ comes, restores the relationship, and it, through faith in Him, now my I am set free. So we 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 just went through this in Romans six about slavery, yeah. to God or slavery to the flesh, yeah. So and it's not, the the slavery we talked about as as we unpacked that was not slavery in the sense of uh against the will mm-hmm. it was slavery um it's a willingness uh, an enjoyment of We're that self slavery. enslaving ourselves yes yeah. so that slavery that that we are in in the flesh before Christ is a desired slavery mm-hmm. and then the slavery we we have after being saved after our eyes have been opened and we're called out of that darkness and into his light and we can see him is a slavery that we desire and that we want. So what happens is my identity is in, is in that slavery, mm-hmm. either the slavery to these things or the slavery to Christ. So as the, as I look at the gospel, as I hear the gospel and I see the gospel and its beauty, then I come out of that and I desire that thing. So if I'm focused as a converted believer on Christ, then my identity is in him mm-hmm. instead of when I'm, when I'm, when I don't have Christ, who do I focus on? Myself. Anything and everything but Christ. You're right. But it's yeah. all, it's all coming back to, to myself too. Yeah. So it's, it's identity. The reason people struggle with identity is because they don't know who they are mm-hmm. and they're trying to figure out what's my purpose in life and this and that. Well, they've got nothing to look at except themselves. Mm hmm. And that, and that wretched sinner that they ultimately are. Maybe people don't see it that way when they're in it. But conversion gives us conversion. The gospel gives us the identity because it gives us Christ. It gives us a view of him and it gives us a focus on him versus a focus on ourselves. So it's taking from the self on to Christ. And not only that, it gives us his righteousness too, which the the right. basis so that, for our new identity is, okay, we are justified. Right. So when you look back at yourself though. Yeah. Now that now that you've been justified, you can see the wretchedness of your old self. Exactly. And so when you're when you're the new creation, you see Christ's righteousness. So again, it's it's either I get to focus on me, or do I focus on Christ? Because and understanding that I have Christ's righteousness, yeah. and the justification that He earned, and all I earned is death and wrath and wrath and yeah. crud and bad stuff. So the the okay, so th- this is important. Okay, so. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this is life I now live. I live by faith. Or if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. This is a fundamental reality of the gospel. Namely, that who you once were is not who you are anymore. There is a fundamental change in identity through the gospel. So, this, this is your identity is no longer in you. Right. And all of the things that messed up the image of God in you have been set right through Jesus Christ. And so like this bothers me, man, this really bothers me. There's a reason that, that the Bible talks about us as saints and, and, and we tend to think of ourselves more in the realm of sinners. Now I'm not saying that we don't sin. But what I'm saying is our fundamental identity is not that of a sinner. A fundamental, our fundamental identity as a believer is that of a justified saint in Jesus Christ. So how, how do you communicate that though? Like, cause we do still sin. Right. And we are still sinners as, um, I use air quotes a lot yeah, here. So, it's so hard, hard to, to see on podcast. <laughs> we still see ourselves as sinners. We are still sinners, but how, how do you, how do you communicate that? You're a saint. Yeah. I think people keep, people look at saints and say, Oh, well, that's, that's somebody that, oh, that's the okay. Roman. 
that's the Roman Catholic view of it. Right. They, they had they had works of super irrigation, which were so much above and beyond anything required that their extra works have been put in the treasury of merits, and now they sit there and, right. and, and that, that has bled over. That's what we think saint in, is. Right. Yeah. So saint uh, is basically set apart one. It, we belong to Jesus. We belong to God. Uh, we are his, he is ours. So here's how, let me, maybe functionally, this is how it would look. Okay. I'm, I'm a, uh, fallen person redeemed by Jesus Christ, yet I still struggle with sin. Okay. So I fall into sin or I willingly even at times commit sin. And so it's not just passive. It can be active too. And I um, I receive God's discipline in some way, whether that's through the conviction of the spirit or whether that's through somebody outside coming and saying, Hey, I see this or my wife or something like that. Right. So I receive that, that discipline and that correction. Now, what do I do with that? Right. That's the, that's the question. Do I sit there in self-loathing and say, oh, well, messed up again. That's just, I'm just such a screw up. Uh, Or do I go back to the gospel and what the gospel does for me and take that sin to Christ with confidence that he has paid for it and that he has forgiven it and that it did not surprise him and that he willingly went to the cross to die for that and that through his death and resurrection that sin has been paid for and I have been adopted into the family of God and I am now loved by God with the same love that he has for his son and disciplined by a loving, perfect father and accepted and, and even, even delighted over. Right. So this identity <laughs> also gives us confidence yes. um, as believers. And that's, that might be a really but big one. But here's the key. Here's the key. Before you go there, here's the key. God does not delight over me because of my performance and my intrinsic right. goodness. He delights over he you because delights you have Christ. He delights in me because I am united with Christ. Right. And that is my identity. Right. That's the, that's the key issue there in the gospel for us to be able to overcome some of these identity issues that we still face as believers is understanding that who I once was is no longer who I am and who I am now is not who I will be when I come to glory. But in the meantime, who I am now is inextricably tied to Jesus Christ and what he's done such that when God looks at me, he sees Christ's righteousness, right? Even though functionally Practically, it doesn't play out every time when he looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. And that is incredibly freeing. Then you run into the the issue, though, of people abusing that Mm -hmm. because, okay, so somebody listens to listens to this or hears that and says, okay, God always sees Christ's righteousness in me as a new as a new creation. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And what people will do is take that as a license to sin. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I'm God's special person and I can do whatever I want to do. He sees Christ in me. Who cares? And here's the, here's the fundamental problem with that mindset. It reveals that you've never really been changed and your identity has not changed. Because if you're looking for excuses to sin, Hmm then you're still a sinner. So would you talk? Do you see what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's straight from Romans chapter six. Yeah. What then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means, how can we who are dead to sin, that's the old, I, I'm yelling into the microphone now. You're getting me <laughs> fired up. That's the old identity being crucified with Christ. Right. How can we who are dead to sin continue to still live in it? You see what I'm saying? That issue is not no. an issue with okay, but the you're, theology. You're, you're looking at things from a biblical theological yes. standpoint. Yes. And so well, we're on a lot of our hobby horses Here we today. Go. But if you don't look at scripture, if you don't look at text from a holistic standpoint, you get into this. If you hear this, say you're listening to this podcast or you hear this idea of my identity is in Christ, your identity is not in your performance. Right. Right. Because we've got a lot of moralistic, moralistic Christians whose identity is found in their performing for God. Yes. That's not, then that, that, that shows you've got an identity issue. Right. You've got an idolization issue of yourself. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the reaction to that, because we are a overreacting society. Pendulum swingers. Yeah. 
is to go all the way to the other side. Okay, well, I don't have to do anything. Right. So the whole point is, no, you need to understand what Scripture says about conversion, what Scripture says about your identity, what Mm -hmm. God has told you. You can't, you don't swing. No, you hate your sin. Yeah. Like this, this is going from being someone who doesn't, who's indifferent about sin. Right. To hating their sin so much because it offends Christ, not because it makes me look like a bad person or I'm not earning this. I'm not right. doing good enough. No, it offends Christ. Right. It offends my God. And, that's, and the, that's my desire because my identity is found in him. So my desire is to please him versus, oh, my identity is found in him. So I'll do whatever I want. I'm free. Let, okay. So let me, let me try to, let me maybe try to phrase this a little bit differently. Can you, as a believer, disappoint and grieve God. Yes, yeah, yeah. you can because you can grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, not everything that you do is perfectly pleasing, practically speaking. Not everything that you do is perfectly pleasing to God. You can grieve the Holy Spirit in by acting in certain ways. But does God abandon you to that? No, he disciplines. He lovingly corrects, he changes, he transforms, he molds, he, he's shaping us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. So there's a balance, right? There, there's got to be a balance. And, and what, but it's so hard I, for a lot of people, it is so hard to function in that balance, to understand the balance of I've been set free. There's no condemnation for me mm-hmm. because I'm in Christ Jesus, even though I sin. How how does that not give me freedom to sin? Or how does the other side of that is how do I not have to to do all this stuff? Like that, yeah, like so, trying to grasp that, I think for people is hard. So God gives us pictures of this, right? He 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 graciously gives us pictures of this in in. Uh, now I recognize that not everybody that's listening maybe came from a great family background, but He gives us pictures of this in uh in parenting and and in and, and in families and and we don't necessarily even understand the whole thing until we have kids of our own it does not please me to to discipline my daughter it grieves me when she disobey i want her to obey i'm like rooting for her to obey so that i don't have to spank her yeah you know and when I, there have been times when like i've had to like like after the fact, like walk out because like, I'm like tearing up. Cause I, I feel for her. Like I see the struggle that she's having, like she's tired or whatever. And she's fighting against that. And, and, and like, it grieves me when she disobeys. It grieves me when she disobeys because she's not trusting me. It grieves me when she disobeys because I'm trying to help her and keep her from pain and sorrow. But that doesn't make her any less your and daughter. Exactly right. That does not make her any less my child. And even in that grief, I love her and I, she always has a place in our home. Her identity is her set. Her identity is set as yeah. my child and it will not change ever, no matter what. So we do this thing before bed. <clears throat> I ask her, we work, we work on identity. We have done this since she was born. Um, in fact, her, her, uh, first Christmas present two months or a month and a half after she was born was a, uh, was a, a picture of her and I with this written on it. <clears throat> you are Finley Grace or Ainsley Joy, whichever child I'm talking to. You are my daughter. I am your papa and I will always love you no matter what. That's I'm, I'm trying from a very young age to, to help her realize that her identity is safe and secure as my child. And that is what we need as Christians. All right. So here, here's the key though at for, because we have to identify in, in that instance as the child. Yes. Does the child love it, Papa in this case? Yeah. So you just say that with such a condescending voice. No, Papa yeah. in this case. <laughs> Normal people don't have their children call them Papa. Well, I will say most <laughs> most grandparents get the name Papa, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so as she as she grows, her obedience and her wanting to do, uh, um what she knows she's supposed to do from uh, a child's perspective in obeying her parents. Mm -hmm. Does that obedience as she grows, is it going to be because her identity is found in uh, Papa loves me or Mm -hmm. take that to us. Our identity is found because God loves me because he showed me that through Christ Mm -hmm. and he sees Christ in me, his perfect child. Mm -hmm. 
that should be what drives us exactly. to obey. Love and acceptance. Yeah. Everybody, not, everybody needs those two things. Not duty. Right. And not uh, law. Not earning. Not Yeah. So like the, the massive shift in identity is from wrath and judgment to acceptance and love. Right. That's like the, that's the, that's the fundamental shift in how we relate to God and how he relates to us. He accepts us even with our flaws because Christ has paid for them and our identity is found in Christ. And he loves us with the love that he has for his son as adopted uh, for us as adopted children. We are loved and accepted. The two things that we need most. The true believer has changed in the fact that they can they had a hard heart do they have a heart of flesh they had a heart that had affections yep. for themselves and everything apart from god yep. and now real believers their affections are rooted to god through christ yes in god through christ sorry so that's what drives you because you're you love god now yeah instead of you loved and everything else but god yeah and that's that's what gives us our identity, and that's what drives us into these. It's not. It's not. I have to do these things. I want to do these things right. because it pleases my father, and he loves me, and I love him. So let me let me let me use this this family thing that God gives us as an illustration of this in another way. Uh, my daughter gets a little bit older, and she starts maybe being teased because she doesn't fit in, or. Uh, there's a standard of beauty that society has set up that she mm. doesn't necessarily fit. And kids maybe say hurtful and mean things to her and say, uh, you're ugly. Okay. At that point, that's an identity issue. Yeah. Right. What she's, what she's going to struggle with is, is what they say about me true or is what Papa says about me true is what mama says about me true. Who do I care more about what they think? Do I care more about what these kids think or do I care about more what, about what I can't even talk or do I care more about what mom and dad think? Um, that's identity. Yeah. All of that's identity issue. Now, uh, transpose that to us and the world and let's, let's help think through this. Sin is lying to us and telling us that we will find joy and satisfaction and comfort and peace and fulfillment in all of these things that are offensive to God. All of these things that are trying to tell, that are trying to draw us away from him. And he tells us, no, you will only find joy and peace and fulfillment and, and satisfaction in me because that's how I designed you. And I have accepted you so you can enjoy that. And at that moment, that's an identity issue. It's the kid at the playground saying, you're ugly. And Papa says, no, you're not. Now, how we act on that matters very much. But the point is that there are, there, there, there are different pulls. In our lives. And so what what we're not saying is that for somebody whose identity is in Christ, that they'll never struggle with sin, that they'll never be tempted to think, oh man, this may be, this may be is better. Like I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that we will quickly realize whether through God's discipline in the Holy Spirit convicting us or through God's discipline in the consequences or through God's discipline in other people in our lives as a loving father, we will be reminded of the fact that that the only place where there is true joy and true peace and true satisfaction is in our relationship with God. And that is secure and set in Jesus Christ such that we are accepted and loved in spite of our failures. That's identity. That's what we're talking about, about having our identity in Christ. And that's, that's different than who it was before. So let me just read something real quick. Uh, like, Maybe, maybe this might be helpful for listeners. If, you're, if you want to find clues as to where identity is being brought up, Look for, look for language of union with Christ, like in Christ type language. So let me give you an, an example in Ephesians chapter one. Um, if you want to know who you are in Jesus Christ and, and who God says you are in Jesus Christ, Ephesians one is great. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So part of our identity in Christ is we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Uh, what does that look like? even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, uh, which he has blessed us in the beloved in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight 
making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things to himself in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we were the, who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So, like, okay, that first 14 verses. Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is laying out who we are in Jesus Christ. Like, I mean, you're you're looking at words like we're we're blessed. It's every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're chosen. We're holy. We're blameless because of Jesus Christ. We're predestined for adoption. We're included in His family. Um, uh, we have redemption and forgiveness. Uh, we have His grace, and this is all stuff that He's lavished upon us. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit, like all of these things. These are this is these are indicators of who we are. And so, if you go forward to Ephesians chapter two, it's really interesting because it says, "And you were dead in your trespasses and sins." That's who you were. That was your identity. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. And the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That is our old identity. And notice the past tenses in those. And then he says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ. So old identity, new identity, right? Like that's, that's a huge thing to grasp onto when we recognize that who we once were is not who we are now and who we are now is not who we will be by God's grace that frees us to be able to pursue God in different ways. Right. I was, I was uh, looking at uh, the book of Colossians while you were talking in, Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, chapter two, um, starting at six, it's uh, you have received Christ Jesus of the Lord. So walk in him. Rooted and built up in him. So those in Christ, like you were talking yeah. about, uh, abounding in thanksgiving. So he, he ties in, and in chapter one and two, he's talking about the gospel and let, uh, and then, uh, towards the end of chapter two, he talks about asceticism mm-hmm. and this thought of self discipline. And he, and at the end of it, after he walks through, I mean, they talk about passing judgment on drink and festivals and extreme disciplines and all these things, uh, have no value, uh, in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. Hmm. So yeah. it's, it's all, it's all tied to the gospel. And then he, he starts right after that. So therefore, yeah, if you have been raised with Christ, so he ties it all back to being in Christ. And then he goes through all of his imperatives. Yeah. Seek the things that are above, not the things of earth. For you have died to the old self and your life is now hidden in Christ with God. Yeah. And then, and then he walks through, uh, don't drink and don't, don't have foul language and don't be an adulterer and don't be sexually immoral. Don't get drunk. Immoral. Don't, right. Yeah. Don't get drunk. You just right. clarify that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, and he, don't lie to one another. Yeah. Uh, put on the new self, which should be renewed in knowledge after its creator. Put on Christ. Right. Yeah. So that new self is Christ. He, the whole, his whole, all these commands are directly rooted because you are in Christ, your new identity, you and this is what it creation. looks to live that out. And this is what it looks like to live that out. So we tend to look at all these imperatives in scripture and say, I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And we forget about the why we forget about the indicative. We, we what, what got, has been done to allow right. that to happen because you are a new creation. Yep. You have new affections. You've been given a new heart. You are tied with Christ. Yeah. You're, you're knit together with him. So let me, let me maybe summarize the way Paul addresses problems in first Corinthians, uh, as, going like this, because Jesus did this for you and you're in Jesus live that way. Right. That's, that's the, all of the, like the don't sue one another. Understand and, yeah, who you are. Yeah. You need to live out the reality of who you are because of what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. It's almost like helping people see you don't want those things 
that you wanted before. Yeah. You yeah. actually want these things that I'm telling you about. Yeah. Well, let me give let me give one more that might be really helpful in thinking through this because a lot of the things we put this thing out on Facebook and a lot of the things that people brought up, I can't find my Facebook. I've got 4,000 tabs open again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Which is a regular. Yeah, that's a regular oh, thing. That's a regular. Uh, so a lot of the things that people brought up were like where people find their identity, career, family, hobbies, friends, social. Um, Corey Kitch said beauty, brains, and brawn, i.e. appearances, intelligence, and accomplishments. And he would add a fourth burnout uh, who finds our identity and sense of superiority through the insight that all the pretty smart, powerful people are total phonies. Um, you've got uh, sexual orientation. You've got sports. Like people had a lot of different things. And here's, 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 the, here's the interesting thing that I found uh, about all of those things. Um, or, or Carmen Selock added uh, not being enough, like talking about uh, I think like Christians that feel like they're, they need to earn and yeah. do. Um here, here's the interesting thing that uh, the correlation between all of those things, uh, marriage was thrown in there too. All of those things are transient, earthly, and self-centered. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to that point, first Peter chapter two, verse nine, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. So Peter now is dealing with identity. This is who you are. Chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's own people. Hadn't received mercy at one point. Now you have received mercy. Once you weren't God's people, now you are God's people. This is who you are. Verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. What's the basis for being able to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul? Our, where our identity is. Yeah. Where our identity, who we, who we really are. If we take verse 11 of chapter two, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war on your soul on its own. It doesn't have the power, but in order to understand what it means to be a sojourner in exile, we have to understand who we really are. This world is not our home. All of the things on this earth are transient. All of the things on this earth will go away. Our identity is not found in the temporal. Our identity is found in Christ and what he has done and who he has made us and, and who we are because of him. And that empowers us to actually fight passions of the flesh because we see them as waging war on our soul. Right. It's not about temporal, earthly, fleeting things. It's about eternal joy in Christ. That's really good. So maybe we should just end there. Okay. So I, I thought a good way to end. Um, let's each talk, let's pick out one thing where we struggle in this area okay. and then how we fight that. Sometimes I just like to read the Bible way too much and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's a, that's a yeah that's 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 a good oh cred just throwing this on me. We're gonna have to maybe cut out some <laughs> thought space because like there's a thousand different illustrations that I could use. Right. So so one that I re the the one that always that regularly pops up for me is um, what other people think. Mm -hmm. I I value. I think it's okay. It's okay to use um, people's critique of you mm -hmm. to see where you need to grow. But I think I over, I can overvalue um, trying to um, gain approval, mm -hmm. trying to prove something to people. And all that is tied into, I need to look good. Mm -hmm. I need to fulfill this. I need to prove to people something. That's, that's an identity thing that says, Christ's approval isn't enough. God's calling on my life isn't enough. I need all these other people to see that this is true too. Yeah. So, and what, like, I tend to go, like, uh, I'll get up on a mountain, be okay, and then I'll go down this valley and <laughs> suck at it for a while. And then something generally will happen um, where I'll hear a statement or somebody will say something um, and it redirects my uh my gaze back to where mm -hmm. it should be. So I just, I lose focus on looking to Christ and drop. And the, what tends to be the correlation with that is I struggle in my quiet times. Mm -hmm. I struggle in my just spending time in prayer and in scripture. 
And as I do that, then then my gaze started, ooh, look at how good I'm doing with, with doing this and doing this. And people yeah. are starting to see all these connections. What good does that do anybody? Yeah. No, I need to point them to Christ. So if, if, if my eyes and my gaze is focused on Christ and on his goodness towards me, which I find to be in praying and in, uh, I tell you what, one of the, one of the greatest gifts you ever gave me was the Valley of Vision book. And if I use that book three to four to five times a week, Mm -hmm. it helps me a ton. Like it, it, it drives me to scripture. It, it just takes, it's, I mean, it's, it's poems basically and it's Puritan prayers, but they're, they're written really poetically. Yeah. And it, for maybe that just works for my, my artistic brain <laughs> as a worship pastor, but it, but it helps like God uses that and it helps uh, me think through things um, from a perspective of how can I see Christ in it versus um, how am I doing this? So yeah. using that little book, working through, through songs on a regular basis, new music instead of getting stuck in a rut mm-hmm. is really good for me. And then it has to be rooted in, am I spending time with God in prayer and in scripture? So, yeah. Uh, so, so how, so that's how you reorient yourself to, uh, to, to what Christ reminding myself where my identity is. Gotcha. It's okay. not in myself. It's in, it's in him. Yeah. I tend to be very busy and I'm very, driven mm-hmm. and um, try to be really productive and produce a lot of results for the time spent, you know? Um, and so what, what that l- lends itself to is finding my identity and my achievements. And I don't necessarily care if anybody else sees it. A lot of times it's just for me. It's like, it's like this, it, it, it's the most self-centered of self-centered thing. <laughs> like I, it's not even doing it for other people. It's doing it so that I can feel like I've achieved something. And ultimately what that comes down to is my own dependence on myself and my foolish thinking that I can do something apart from God's grace that's significant eternally. And, and what ends up happening in, in that uh, quest for, I, I don't know if you'd call it productivity maybe, um, in that drive, Mm -hmm. um, is it's very easy to neglect actually spending time with the Lord and it's easy to get focused on tasks and goals and aims and lose focus on Christ and the gospel. It's easy to spend time working toward, uh, ends and ignore the, the means that, that, that God is the one that does that. And, and ultimately it's, it's easy for that to be damaging and harmful to my family uh, because I just sometimes just need to stop and spend time with my family and with my kids while they're young and, and these different things like that. So it can hurt relationships. Uh, But ultimately that what it is, is it's, it's looking at myself and, and depending on myself and my own abilities and my own drive and, and finding a sense of pride and accomplishment in making the most of my time, which isn't necessarily a bad thing at at times, but it it can be. And so I think the intent behind it, I mean, really matters. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and a lot of times what I find that intent going to is not, all right, I want God to be glorified, but I want to be seen as leaving something. Yeah. You know, like leaving a legacy or leaving a, leaving something worth, worth looking at. Which, and if the legacy you want to leave is that exactly. people can see more of Christ, that's that's a good thing. But but what yeah, that, that it's very deceptive. Yeah, it's very deceptive because I like I there are times when I'm just kind of like yeah, I just like to be able to be like I want somebody to read a book about me someday. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm dead serious. Like yeah. that's like and so like my identity uh, tends to be found in my accomplishments and my busyness and stuff like that. And so what what I have to force myself to do is to stop and sit back. And remind myself consistently that I can't do anything apart from the grace of God, that God's will will go forward and I'm merely a tool. Mm. And maybe my role is to be a, uh, like a little shim that nobody sees and keep something together behind the scenes and no one ever notices. And, and I'm okay with that because, um, because as long as he's, 
got me and I'm, I've got him like that's it, just taking time to stop and, and delight in my relationship with God and my relationship with others that enjoy God's gifts. Like maybe that's what it comes down to is partially with the, with the identity thing is part of reminding myself of who I am in Jesus Christ is reminding myself that I'm not him mm. and I need to enjoy the good gifts that he gives me at times uh, instead of trying to produce stuff. Yeah, that's so good. Just reminding myself, I, I didn't, I didn't contribute to my salvation. I'm not going to be the ultimate cause of somebody else's salvation, and I'm not going to be the ultimate cause of the church being grown. He builds the church, and I need to, I need to be willing to be used by him, but rest in his power. So I think one of the there's a there's kind of a common thread between the same two things is I think both of us um, we kind of we kind of uh, pull back from people. Yeah. So we go we go by ourselves. Like I'll. Mm-hmm. I'll Stop hanging out a little bit. Stop visiting. I'll stop uh, doing the maybe just being with people and having those and building those relationships when those things happen. Mm-hmm. So being around other believers that help helps remind you of that. Yeah. Being around our families helps yeah. remind us that we've got some responsibilities there. Yeah, and help those those people help God uses those people to yeah. help direct us back towards uh, what we should be focusing on versus ourselves. Yeah, so absolutely. So good. Uh, you can check us out on uh, Facebook. We've got a Facebook group. You can, and a Facebook page and we're on Instagram and you can find this and more content on pastor discussions.com. Feel free to email us if you've got show ideas or if you heard something that you would like uh, clarified, or if we need to do another episode on this, whatever, send us a message at pastor discussions at gmail.com. And if you want to be part of our group, you can send a request too. We've got a yeah. we've got a uh, group that we talk about things on Facebook. So if you want to be a part of that and comment on things and have some discussions within that group, go yeah. ahead and join there as well. And then uh, if you'd like to write for us, if you're a writer and yeah. you want to write for the blog, then send us a email or you can go to pastordiscussions.com forward slash write dash four dash us and check that out. And we will be back next week with another conversation on doctrine, faith, and the Christian life. What was that? I think that was Alexa. Alexa, stop. That was weird. (laughs) Shut up! Um, so I'll let you get that and then you can edit that. We're getting out. Yeah. (laughs)